Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Markets for Millennials for our weekly analysis from August 1st through August 5th. Um, and uh, thank you for tuning in. I apologize. Uh, we were not able to have a video last week. Um, a lot of things have been going on in the market. So if we just start off by taking a step back and thinking about what has transpired, obviously here on the S&P 500, um, our low um, that has been put in so far was on June 16th. Um, the things that have transpired since then, uh, we had the CPI in uh, released in July for June, um, came in at 9.1. Um, and at that point, uh, the market sold off, but then um, the market essentially has bought into the fact that inflation has peaked, um, at least on a headline basis and perhaps even on a core PCI uh, basis. Um, and, uh, and so the market has continued to appreciate up since then. Um, as we got into late July, we had the FOMC meeting where uh, when, when the CPI first um, came in, uh, the market began to price in 100 basis points of a hike, uh, thinking that the Fed would react very strongly to uh, to that information. But they came out in the days following, which is part of what added to the rally, and they alleviated investors' concerns that we were gonna they were gonna hike more uh, than the 75 basis points. They just said 75 was good. Market rallied. Uh, we came to the FOMC meeting. The um, 75 basis point hike uh, was instituted. They removed forward guidance, um, which to the market, the market uh, took that as a sign that uh, the data dependency was going to um, signal that uh, because we have been seeing some data prior to that meeting that had suggested that the um, inflation uh, either that inflation they I, I guess i should say the market it was assuming that inflation was peaking and then they also were were seeing job numbers uh they were um the unemployment claims starting to rise a little bit not not in a significant degree but starting to rise a little bit and they began to see economic numbers suggesting that um recession was coming we obviously got the gdp print uh, which suggested that, uh, you know, the technical recession, the two quarters uh, in a row of negative GDP uh, month or uh, quarter over quarter. Um, and so uh, because of all of this, the market has been assuming the Fed pivot is impending and ha going to happen sooner um, rather than later. Uh, and, well, some uh, the markets are in a really interesting place uh, because um, if you look at what's happening on a technical basis. We'll get into the technicals a little bit more uh, in a moment. On a technical basis, we have had uh, some pretty good repairs um, on the S&P um, and, uh, and also on the Russell uh, breaking out of a trend line that has been established from the November high and then the March bounce. And um, uh, so that has been a breakout that is uh, still kind of continuing to the upside. Um, so uh, you're seeing the moves in risk assets in general. Uh, you haven't really seen with even with the bad CPI and things like that in the recession. Uh, you haven't seen things selling off in a, a pretty substantially. Um, you're even getting gold uh, participating in on the action just on a tear over the last couple of weeks. Um, you're seeing people selling oil as a result of the um, assumption of demand destruction. Um, people are selling oil like crazy. Again, we'll get into those technicals uh, in just a little bit, um, but the markets are in an interesting place because uh, the elimination of forward guidance by the Fed uh, and their assurance that they're going to be data dependent has kind of been thrown into, uh, ha had a wrench thrown into it um, by economic data this week. So um, on Monday, we had ISM manufacturing PMIs come in um, and you can see the number I've highlighted here. Um, it uh, is at about, it, it came in the uh, on Monday slightly lower than the previous month, um, which was expected. Uh, it was expected to come in lower. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember if, the, uh, if this number was higher than the number that they expected it to be or lower. Um, but the point is on a month over month basis, it was lower. Um, but then what, what was interesting was on Wednesday, the ISM services, or as they call it, the non-manufacturing PMI came in, and it came in higher uh, than the last two months, um, breaking uh, the trend of 
multiple months in a row going back to March, the March data um, uh, of lower numbers. So, so you can see the March numbers were reported 58.3, April 57.1, May 55.9, uh, June 55.3. Um, you can actually uh, get the sense that the rate of change was slowing and then we actually had uh, the July uh, non-manufacturing services PMI come in higher. So that was the first kind of knock to uh, uh, to the idea that there that we were. I think the market was expecting that we were going to get a load of of economic data in during the month of July uh, and in the month of August, uh, which will and potentially even in the month of September. That either by the time Jackson Hole comes at the end of August or um, by the time the FOMC meeting in September comes along. Um, that there will be considerable amounts of economic data that would suggest uh, recessionary um, slowdown and that that would force the Fed to pivot from raising rates. Um, now, uh, not only was this a surprise, but also uh, this morning we released, uh, they released the non-farm payrolls um, and uh, they blew expectations out of the water. The expectations were, were for I think about half of the 528,000 uh, non-farm payroll employment uh, that was added in July. And so the unemployment rate edged down. I, I think the market was surprised because on a week by week basis, the um, the uh, claims, uh, the weekly jobless claims had been slowly, slightly ticking up. Now there's a lot of data that a lot of other accounts uh, and people on Twitter are unpacking. I'm not going to take the time to do that here, but I'm just acknowledging that on a headline basis, um, this was the next blow uh, to the suggestion that um, that in the month of August we were going to get July data that showed things were slowing, uh, and this is already um, these are already now two data points that um, are contrary to what the I believe the market was um, expecting. And then when you add to that um, the the preferred, I'm going to highlight this, the preferred uh, inflation metric, which is the core PCE, which um, is really more about growth um, than it is about inflation. But it does the, the Fed does prefer to use it as kind of their barometer uh, for uh, prices and expenditures and things like that. Um, and uh, and so uh, what what you notice um, with core PCE. Um, is that the number, uh, and this was released on, uh, this was released last Friday um, before the end of uh, July um, for the month of June, um, which was kind of interesting because the June uh, PCE data came after the FOMC uh, meeting, which I, I pointed out on Twitter. But in any case, um, we had uh, on a month over month basis uh, was um, higher, which is concerning on a a uh, three-month annualized basis. We also had a, a pretty significant acceleration, um, and just the absolute number was uh, on the year-over-year -year basis was higher. Um, and uh, and then when you think about um, just like normal headline PCE, um, that was also accelerating. Um, now on a three-month annualized basis, it's it's a, it's kind of decelerating, but not to the same degree. Um, as some of the other things are uh, slowing, um, and so, um, so on. An in, uh, it's interesting because um, the the PCE includes fuel and energy, the the headline PCE, and so that's coming off, which you get the sense like, okay, because you know energy prices, oil is coming down, then that means that the headline PCE is going to be uh, is going to show. Um, uh, Kind of a, a negative uh, annual month over month annualized rate uh, of change, um, but then the core, which is when you take out those other things, um, the food and the energy, uh, that's when when you see that accelerating, um, both on an annualized basis, on a month over month basis, and on a year over year basis, that is not good. So even going back to last week, before these, uh, before the you know services PMI and before the. Um, non-farm payrolls came in. I've already been, you know, trying to call the market uh, and call people out on the fact that like things are not trending the right direction, uh, and the market, in my opinion, is severely mispricing um, itself right now, uh, given the information that we do have. 
So having said all of that, right, those are, those are some really important things uh, to consider. Um, and uh, obviously uh, next, uh, I think next week, I'm trying to remember, I think next week on Wednesday we have um, the CPI and then uh, next Thursday we have the PPI numbers and those will be a big deal. Um, and so now with all of that um, kind of as a backdrop, um, let's take a look at what's going on in the technicals. Um, and I'll start actually by going to the um, euro dollar implied federal funds futures. So this is a euro dollar contract. That's the ZQ um, December contract of this year. Um, and obviously uh, our high was um, put in when the market thought the Fed was going to uh, hike 100 basis points. Um, and then obviously that was alleviated. Um, and uh, we did not make a lower low in the implied uh Fed funds rate uh, based on the euro dollar futures. We actually got, uh, we put in a, a higher low and on today's non-farm payrolls, um, we are now pricing in actually not a hundred basis points higher uh, of a hike, but actually, um, excuse me, um, but actually another 125 basis points of hiking. And so it doesn't really matter how you slice that. I mean, if you, if you don't believe that the Fed is going to do 100 basis points in September, um, even even if they did, that does not match what the market is betting that the, f the federal funds rate will be as of the information that we have now. And so, um, so it doesn't matter how you slice it. Getting 125 basis points uh, for the September, um, October, and December meetings, I think it's September... October, December, or maybe it's September, November, December. I have to look at the numbers or at the calendar again. But um, in any case, we basically have three more meetings to get 125 basis points according to what the market is is pricing in. And so, is that going to be, you know, 75 and then 50? Uh, is that going to be uh, 50, 50 and then 25? Is that going to be uh, 75, 25, 25. I, I don't really know, um, but it is interesting. This is also trending the wrong direction, and I don't think that the market is pricing itself properly with that in mind. Um, so I wanted to look at that. Um, additionally, what's what's really interesting is even on the news and even on the market price action. And I think you know we had a, a little bit of a pump late in the day to kind of offset some of the losses, um, but the VIX is still trending down. And I've been tracing this for some time. I'm just going to like try to scroll back really quick. Hopefully that this works. Um, and uh, we have a couple of different paradigms that we could look at for the, the VIX. Let me just do this so that it looks a little bit uh, cleaner. Um, and uh, what's really interesting is if you look at the uh, from October 07 when the market topped to March 09 when the market bottomed during the great financial crisis uh, era of, the, of time, um, the paradigm that I'm that I'm looking into, if we're, if we're looking at this as our lens, um, as an example of what um, the VIX can look like as it is pricing in things, um, then obviously the paradigm uh, would suggest that we've been kind of in this area of the process. And, and again, I'm not saying we're repeating 2007 to 2009, but I think everybody should be aware because what was going on here is we had similar action in the VIX uh, as we did now. Um, then it broke kind of lower. And this is during the period of time where, you know, in early to mid-2008, they were talking about how subprime was contained um, and things like that. Um, and the market was, uh, in a sense, um, uh, calling the possibility that, um, or I mean, they, I, how can I say, they, we were just... The, the market was expecting that things were going to be okay. There were, there were occasional bounces. So let me, let me uh, throw up the uh, SPX on a price scale um, so that you guys can see kind of uh, line by line. You can actually see during that period of time, if you look up here um, in comparison, um, that's the period of time where we got uh, one of the more severe of the um, bounces, bear market rallies, um, and I think that's kind of where we're at, uh, in a sense, if, if we're using this sort of paradigm um, to look at what's going on in the in the market. OK, so um, the VIX making lower lows, grinding lower uh, and lower and lower, um, having broken kind of the, the trend line. Um, and 
and uh, obviously we know how that turned out uh, later on. So you actually see, and I've, and I've been saying the VIX, I mean, bear markets don't end with the VIX lower than 35, essentially. And we've been in the low 20s now for quite a while, um, for at least a few weeks uh, in the 20s in general, and then in the lower 20s for a few weeks. So, um, uh, and so that's, if you're looking at this as your paradigm, then that's uh, obviously got to bring you some, some caution. So um, even though, we could bounce for a long time. We could bounce for a couple months. Um, if you actually look uh, based on this chart um, from March 08 until uh, late May of 08, that's, you know, what, two and a half months of time that went by um, before the market ultimately uh, started to come back down, come back off again and make lower lows. I mean, we could do that. And it, it could be, uh, let's see, the market bottom in, in July um, currently, uh, or I'm sorry, in June currently, we could bounce all the way into through August uh, or I'm sorry uh, we bounced through July we could continue to bounce through August um, and maybe even into September before we make new lows and and, and again I don't want to nobody knows what's going to happen but that's just a possibility um, and the other paradigm uh, that I've been looking at recently as we look at the VIX is uh, the dot-com bubble right until the bottom which obviously was another protracted bear market um, and there are actually a couple of areas uh, that would match this paradigm and uh, that's kind of right here um, if you think about making a uh, breaking a trend line on the VIX um, that was another very ferocious uh, bear market rally um, and then we also have uh, kind of this area right here which is a slightly less uh, kind of on the tail end of, a, of another bounce um, but that is a similar spot uh, where the VIX was kind of breaking a trend line um, as the market was bouncing. Um, and then yet we still had far more downside to go. Um, and so I think it's just something to be aware of um, as we go. Um, so let me get uh, out of this and we will jump back into the equities. Um, and uh, so just looking at what's going on here, um, the S&P 500 broke uh, a trend line, which I, I must say, I don't really think that it's that strong of a trend line. Um, the trend line actually uh, originally, if I get this back up here, uh, originally was right there. Um, and um, and so uh, we obviously already had a breakout, um, but then I did adjust it this way because I was just curious. Um, so this is where we get into, again, some of the art of technical analysis. This is probably a better way to view the trend line. Um, and so th that's a mistake that I made, uh, you know, putting it up. Uh, it just normal practice. I usually will put it to the top of the highest uh, red wick on on uh, whatever bounce is appropriate, um, and keeping it like this uh, actually um, would have shown better where the uh, S and P got trapped in June before falling again, um, and where the breakout actually occurred, um, and then a retest on this. Uh, horizontal uh, support, which had been resistance. Um, and so so we have that breakout, but I think it's interesting that, um, you know, and you'll see this on the NASDAQ, you actually uh, can see that we haven't, we're kind of stuck in that same range right before uh, price gave out uh, in the um, May CPI, which also was a surprise. Um, and uh, and so I think that that's an interesting place. We're kind of stuck in, in this zone between, uh, I mean, kind of if you want to look at this spot as a uh, as a good uh, uh, a good line of uh, resistance. Let me uh, get this marked here. If you just want to mark that spot, maybe that's a better spot. Um, but uh, these other trend lines that I've had, I've actually had going back even to the market rising. So I'll add it in uh, just for the sake of having it. Um, it'll be really important to break above that, um, but the most important S&P trend line is the one uh, connecting the uh, market top um, to the dead cat bounce in March. Um, it has been a pretty ferocious rally, but the uh, bear market rallies typically are the most ferocious. Um, so uh, this is something to definitely be aware of. Oh, whoops, uh, is is that spot um, on the Nasdaq? Uh, interesting spot um uh, high beta and uh the tech stocks in the nasdaq have obviously on the in terms of equities been the greatest beneficiaries of uh this the last couple of weeks um ever since uh you know mid to late june we've been on this bounce um and uh the nasdaq came right up into this trend line 
um, which has been so far, obviously that marked the, uh, the top of the bounce in March. Um, and so this was actually an appropriate place uh, to lean in to try to sell, uh, to take a position to the downside if, that was, if that's something that you are uh, interested in doing. Um, and it's funny because this is, this is the logical area to see a rejection and it just so happens that it coincided with the non-farm payrolls. Um, uh, but, uh, um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see if we can get above this level um, to break out. Uh, maybe next week, maybe going into next week, we get a little bit more follow through on the bounce. Um, but what's interesting is if you realize um, from our closing high, which was back in November, um, the market today is only closed 20% down, which is pretty incredible considering at the lowest point we were over 32% down. And so uh, the retrace on this uh, in this you know bounce has been pretty incredible. The NASDAQ from its closing low up almost 20% off the bottom, uh, a little, about 18.5% to be more precise. Um, so very interesting. Um, we we actually only on the Nasdaq, as far as the equity indices are concerned, um, only the Nasdaq has made a higher high from from its little mini bounce in June. Um, which again, uh, I think it's important to point out that this spot right here, where the markets were appreciating uh, and then got kind of stuck here right before the uh, May CPI report, um, which was released in the um, early part of June. Um, this the reason why the market was here was because back in june they were saying oh the may cpi was going to be lower because they were saying that the that inflation was peaking in april and so um i think we're seeing something similar like i, I think probably the worst thing that could happen is on the tails of this um this employment report that we just got today if next week's cpi is higher than 9.1 uh, or if any part of the data shows acceleration or 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 like kind of month over month that the the rate of change month over month is increasing or on an annualized basis i think that's going to just like that's going to tank everything and we'll make new lows i think that's the the thing that the markets uh are not adequately pricing in right now is that possibility there's not a not a whole lot of downside risk um being protected uh, or being hedged i should say um, in my, as far as I'm aware. So, um, but on the NASDAQ, uh, really interesting place again, having made a higher high, tested it and then come up and resumed up, um, but resuming up right into the strong trend line support. Um, and so looking ahead to next week, um, this is not a place, and this is, you know, if you didn't buy in this area, this is not, right up here is not the place to chase. And, um, and that's kind of the thing that has really made me have pause. A lot of people calling this the bottom and people high-fiving each other because they say that, oh, they bought the bottom, uh, they bought the dip at the bottom and that they, uh, or people saying, oh yeah, I held strong and now we're gonna go back up and make you know, new highs, whether it be on the NASDAQ or the S&P or crypto or whatever. Um, the biggest problem is typically, uh, especially retail, usually are the ones that are selling the bottom. They're, they're not usually celebrating saying, oh, I bought the bottom. In general, the sentiment is more of, I'm getting out, it's, this is over, like I, I'm just, I just need to stay out of the markets. And they sell out of it. They, they're usually not high-fiving themselves saying, yeah, I bought the dip. Um, so the whole like psychological mindset of uh, a lot of, of, of retail um, particularly is totally in the wrong place um, at this particular point in the game. Um, so, th and so, and this is the point where on a bounce like this, people who were fearful, maybe they were holding, maybe they were starting to sell right here, they were fearful, and then so they didn't buy, and then this is a spot where everyone's pretty excited uh, and i'm thinking i'm thinking we got on the third and the fourth this week on wednesday and thursday i'm thinking we got a lot of retail fomo on those days um and chasing price and I, those people unfortunately are going to be the ones that get hurt if this is not the bottom and i'm again i don't have a crystal ball my bias is towards the bottom and that's not because i want it to be it's i mean who wants, you know, like I, I am holding a, uh, you know, or I'm hodling a Bitcoin position, which I, so I don't want 
uh, there to be further downside because that's uh, that's something I'm just gonna hold forever. Um, I want it to appreciate, so I don't want it to go lower. But um, so you just need to understand this is, you know, it's not desirable to hold this to have this kind of downside bearish bias. But I can't make the markets do what I want. I only can react off of what they're showing me, and what they're showing me is that I should not chase this. And um, so anyway, and, and that it's we're more likely to go and make lower lows than we are to go make higher highs right now. Um, so um, on the Dow, uh, it's a little bit of an interesting situation. Um, this is why, again, YTA is an art. Um, it's, it's really hard to know exactly where to, uh, to place um, the, uh, the trend line. Um, if you go by, you know, kind of normal rules uh, of placing lines, then it would be tempting to uh, place the line right there, uh, which would indicate that we have a lot of space between where the Dow is and where it's really significant overhead resistances. But if you lower the trend line to uh, right there, then you actually, you get this kind of fake breakout uh, in April. Um, and then you get uh, the you get us at resistance right now. Um, so it, I, maybe I'll leave it for at right here for now. But if price does break out from this going into next week, then I will move it back to where I had it. Um, let me go back to the S and P. Oh yeah. So you don't have that same problem on the S and P. All right. Uh, the Russell I mentioned this earlier um, broke out from its trend line. Um, and again, like you even kind of face that similar issue here because um, if you put the trend line there, then we've already, then, then we had a, we, I mean, we still had a breakout, but, um, but it's just the, the location of the breakout and the level or the uh, strength of the resistance, I guess, changes, right? So um, in any case, I think that this is fair. We did break out from there. We came down and retested it and resumed off. Um, the Russell is into resistance at its, uh, it's exactly at its uh, like fluttering around. You can see on the right side of my screen that the red and the um, gray is kind of alternating because the futures markets haven't closed officially yet. They won't for another 15 minutes, but, um, but we are at uh, closing right around the spot of the, uh, the high um, from the bounce going into June on the Russell. Um, from our June highs, I should say. So um, pretty pivotal spot. So it's interesting because some markets have broken out from important trends, trend lines, but are at significant resistance. And then some are on the verge of breakout, after, but, but they are overbought. And, and in all these cases, all of these markets are overbought. And so I think that's something to, uh, to consider. Um, on the dollar, um, I've been I have been waiting for a long time to put a trend line uh, for overhead resistance. Um, you can obviously see that the trend has been up on the DXY, um, and I, like, I okay. So what can I say here? Let me go to the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen, uh, really quick. Um, this is not to maybe well it is kind of to toot my own horn here because a lot of people have been calling dollar top for some time. Uh, the U.S. dollar Japanese yen was way ahead of itself and needed to retrace. Um, and uh, I bought the yen, uh, or I bought the U.S. dollar yen, um, almost exactly uh, at the wick. I, I actually technically bought it um, at 137.50 because that's where the uh, uh, that's where the uh, underside support was um, and we were if we just go back to the DXY according to my uh, SAMS indicator um, we were getting oversold in an uptrending market um, and uh, while in neutral SAMS and so uh, and, and on support and not just support like from that trend line but look at where the uh, look at where the 50 day moving average is if I turn this off you know the, that blue line that 50 day moving average boom right there so um, that was an excellent place to lean in. And, and to me, nothing um, in the fundamental macro backdrop suggests that the dollar is top tier. Again, people are, are making this assumption because they think that the Fed is closer to a pivot than not. And people are just used to the paradigm of, of weaker dollar um, that, they, that they, again, they're reading what they want to happen or what they think should happen into the markets rather than 
just taking what the market is giving them. Um, so it's also it's kind of concerning when you think about it too. If we uh, if we overlay the uh, the cues um, into this, um, it's really interesting to note uh, that the biggest part of when the, when the Nasdaq broke out of its uh, kind of uh, it, what looked like a bull pen, uh, or I'm sorry a bear like uh, wedge uh, like an ascending wedge. Let me just uh, kind of draw that when it broke out from that uh, that general formation. Um, that's been basically this whole time that the dollar has come off. And so I think that uh, you have to be really careful because um, if the dollar continues to the upside, which I personally think it will, uh, then you are uh, you're going to look at basically risk assets really come off hard. Um, and I think that this trend line is probably appropriate. Um, we kind of broke out, but then kind of sold back down below. Maybe I'll adjust it to maybe something like this. Um, and we'll just kind of see from there. I'm um, kind of closing at that spot on the DXY. But if, um, if we come above it uh, and take off from there, um, then my, my, my zone, uh, I'm assuming based on the, uh, the rate at which the DXY has been coming up, uh, in the macro backdrop and when I think uh, things may start changing. Um, I th it's not that I think that the dollar is going to just go up, 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 up. A lot of people are calling 120. Um, I actually don't think so. I think that we're going to get, uh, I think we're going to get somewhere between 110 and 115, which again, again, is a pretty, pretty big range. But I think when we get into October and November, that's when the uh, that's when the market will start to see the Fed actually getting ready to pivot rather than uh, the market assuming the Fed is going to pivot when the Fed has made no indication that they're going to pivot. Um, so that's kind of uh, my time horizon for that. So I think the dollar trade is going is going to go uh, pretty well. Um, bullish dollar for a little while. Um, and then if we look here at yields and this actually this video updates pretty long. Sorry about that. That's what happens when you miss a week. Um, what's really interesting when you look at the yields, uh, you've got really significant people, macro people online saying that, you know, yields are coming off. Uh, what I think is really interesting is no matter how you slice it, um, you know, a lot of people were watching, and I posted about this on Twitter, a lot of people were watching this uh, kind of head and shoulders pattern looking for, um, and guys like Raul Powell said um, on Twitter that there's nothing between this breakdown and basically 2%. And um, I, which I disagreed with um, personally, but obviously I'm, you know, who, who am I? I'm not really anybody uh, to most people. But in any case, I've long held the belief that this reminds me of kind of the March 2021 into July and August of 2021, where we were coming off and everybody, including myself, was convinced we were not going to see 2%, that at 2%, the Fed was going to have to pivot, that they, they weren't going to be able to service the debt, all kinds of stuff like that. I was in that camp. Um, and, uh, and then look at where we are now. So... I have a suspicion. I'm not saying that we're going to just break out from here and go, but um, I think we're more likely to find support, uh, you know, somewhere in this area. It, it may be where maybe we've already kind of hit a bottom and we're going to just appreciate up again. Um, but either here or here is, is a much more likely technical spot to catch support um, uh, before uh, moving higher. I actually do still think that we are going to get one more higher high. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know when. I don't know how. I don't know if it's going to be a quick move up and then a, you know, kind of like a blow off or something like that. But I do think we're likely to get at least up near where we made a high, if not higher, um, before we end up um, going back towards the long term, uh, you know, downward uh, price action on the yield at least. Um, but what's interesting is um, whether you do the head and shoulders view uh, or whether you do a, kind of a trend line, um, a descending trend line view, um, the yields are have broken out. And if and as long as nothing hap else happens in the next seven and a half minutes from the time of recording here, it's going to close above it. So technically, it's this would be considered then a fake breakdown. Um, and I think that that's, well, well, it's kind of important to think about. 
Um, so, I mean, you could probably adjust the trend line. I'm sure people will. A lot of times when people, you just have to be aware of this with yourself. When, uh, when you have a thesis, when you have something that you think is going to happen, um, you tend to adjust your look or adjust your data to support what you are hoping will happen. So again, I saw a lot of people watching this trend line. So now the question is, are these are people going to move the trend line to support that it's, or just, to, just so that they could say, well, no, it's not a breakout, it was rejected. And, you know, that remains to be seen. All, all I'm saying is that, you know, it might actually not, they, the, they might actually have another uh, leg up. That's just something I'm just wanting to be aware of for myself. Um, let me take a quick look, because I've been doing this for way too long. Let me take a quick look at gold. Um, it's been interesting. Um, gold had a, a fake breakout and then an actual breakout. Um, and so, again, we run into a situation where where is the appropriate place to put the trend line? Uh, it might be here. Uh, it might be here. It might be there. Um, so um, I like this spot. Um, this, to me, makes the most sense. Um, showing where the uh, resistance came in and then now it's being retested as support. Um, is this going to be a fake breakout and are we going to keep going down? Um, for a long time I've been wondering what is gold trying to tell us because gold has not been trading uh, like you would think. Um, it's just been going down, 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 down. Um, not really sure, um, but it is something to be aware of. Um, it's still not attractive to me. Um, you know, from a technical standpoint, this this probably is a wise place to to lean in um, to take to try to get some upside. Um, your risk reward is pretty well known. The only problem is that 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 I have like because again, on a technical basis, when you have a trend line like this, this is an appropriate place to buy if it resumes up. However, if we go just from our closing low. I mean, gold, for being gold, like, you know, we're not talking about the same types of percentages uh, of price appreciation that we would for like crypto or whatever. Um, but gold being up 5%, uh, you know, 4 to 5% or more um, in th essentially three weeks is, that's a big move for gold. And this is not something that I would, ch I would chase personally. Um, so uh, I like, you know, I had a, uh, I actually took a, a short trade, uh, a quick trade. I shouldn't say a short trade because it was to the upside. Um, right on uh, on June 20 or July 20th, I took a gold miners position um, and uh, rode that out until um, until we I saw this uh, breakout fade back below the trend line, and I actually sold the position. And I, you know, you could say, oh, you should have held it because now we're just going to keep going up. But I felt pretty good about that gain, um, and so. I think that, uh, you know, that's something I'm willing to live with um, for, you know, live to fight another day, take the next play. Um, I don't, I mean, it, if I think that there still is going to be like a big, um, everything is correlated, uh, move down, kind of like a, a March 2020 crash type of situation, if I think that that's going to happen, then I do believe gold will have to get hit. Um, and so, um I don't. I don't feel bad about not being a, a part of that price action or a part of this, uh, you know, extra little bit that's that's here. Um, I may regret it next week or in a couple months if this never goes down back to this level again. But for now, I, I feel okay about that. Um, oil. Um, I mentioned this. Um, uh, people have been selling oil. It's not really important as to why they're selling oil right now. Um, my personal view is that the fundamentals uh, for oil are strong um, in general. And if you think the Fed is going to pivot, a lot of people have been talking about this. If, if you think the Fed is going to pivot, then how does oil not go up? Um, how is that not bullish for oil? Um, if the if the Fed is going to reverse course and start supporting the markets again, I just, I just don't get the logic of people thinking the Fed pivot is coming, but oil is going to sell off. The demand is still going to be there, in my opinion. Um, so anyway, um, I did remove the, uh, the Fibonacci levels because I think that those are, I think it's okay to take those off. I think they're invalid now. Um, but we are going to come to, we are coming to a, a place of uh, strong support really soon. Um, and we've got this trend line resistance that I think will be important for us to break out from. Um, but on a longer term basis, it's entirely possible um, that we are playing around 
in here for a long time before getting a, a breakout. So um, I think that oil will go and make new all-time highs. Like, I mean, and when I say all-time, I mean all-time. I think that will happen. It's just a matter of timing. And the reality is, is that if your timing is wrong, then you're wrong uh, to a degree. But um, so I don't know uh, if this is going to happen this year, if it's going to happen next year, but I can't see a scenario with the macro the way it is that oil doesn't go past 150, in my opinion. So uh, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, I will not look at silver today because um, uh, I just kind of feel the same about silver as I do on gold. Um, I will say this, though, on Bitcoin. I'm just going to really quickly invert this chart. I've been uh, I posted this back uh, kind of around this area. Um, where is uh, where is Bitcoin going to go? If you invert the chart and you didn't know it was Bitcoin, um, what would you think? The, where would you think this chart would go? Um, you would probably bet that it was going to uh, go to the upside, um, and that's kind of my position. Again, I don't want it to do that. I'm just realistically, I, that's just where I think the market is going to go um, eventually, and I think the the most logical place to actually get that action to the downside would probably be at the confluence of the overhead resistance um, from this channel as well as the long-term trend line. Um, and, um, and, and we could totally have that happen. We could, you know, come to the bottom of the channel, come up to the top of the channel, and then finally break down. Or maybe this is, you know, going to break down sooner. I don't know. Um, but that's the bias right now. Again, not desirable, but that's what looks like it could happen and i do think it's important to point out these trend lines are all um cloned they're not you know so they're all the same they're the same line let me just move this down and show you same line same line same line same line and i think that that's important to point out because in the if you're if you're not familiar with how market symmetry works um we, we did the same thing with like the most important trend line in crypto um you know, if if I just go over here, if I uh, take the time really quickly to put this line in, we did this actually quite a bit uh, along the way, and it was uh, showing really good spots uh, for support and things like that. So, um, market symmetry works in lots of different ways. It's not just like you know the market is going to generally follow this uh until it breaks out finally you can be pretty sure that this line to the downside is going to provide good resistance but then the question is what about counter trend rallies and even counter trend rallies sometimes not all the time but sometimes counter trend rallies uh can be symmetrical in nature um and so uh i think that that's a a, a pretty big deal a uh, pretty important thing to point out um so um the fact that all of these lines are cloned, right, suggests that the the market symmetry is that we're generally in a downtrend, but periodically we'll get these cha up these channel uptrends um, on these bounces, and then they'll eventually break down, um, like they have multiple times now. Okay, we've already had one, two breakdowns. Um, could we break out finally? Sure, um, but it's not as likely, in my opinion. So anyway, uh, that's my look at the markets today um, for this week. Um, thank you for tuning in. I know that this video was long, so I appreciate those of you who have stuck around for this. And um, I uh, hope you have a great weekend and stay safe. And I will see you guys next week.